Please kneel as you are able. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose most dear son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We are reading a portion of Psalm 102. We will read responsibly by whole verse. My heart is smitten like grass and withered, so that I forget to eat my bread. I have become like a vulture in the wilderness like an owl among the ruins. My enemies revile me all day long, and those who scoff at me have taken an oath against me.
When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. I know a whole lot. I know the protection of of dedicated parents who kept me safe as a child and who loved me fiercely through all of my growing and changing. I know the butterflies present in a stomach on the first day of school, eager to learn as much as I could to help shape the person that I hope to become. I know the love of a partner who cares for me when my Crohn's disease is flaring and I am in a lot of pain. I know what it's like to to hold the hand of somebody who has just learned of a difficult diagnosis or a life-changing loss or who has just had a plain old bad day. And I know about the ones that have done the very same for me. I know the Psalms, having chanted them so often in all of my years as an Episcopalian, I know what it's like to have hangnails all over my fingers from practicing a bit too much on the organ or the piano. And I know the joy of sitting on the bench when the piece finally comes together. I know fear and doubt. I know pain and desperation. I know pride and satisfaction. And in an age of expertise, I could claim that I am an expert at many things. And in an age of, well, why don't you just go and do it? I can say that I've been there and I've done that. And I can hope here right now that in just these last few moments that I've begun to sell you on the fact that I know what I'm doing. (laughs) But I also know something else. And that is that we've gathered here this afternoon to recollect the trial of God the day that we put our Savior on trial, the day that we executed him. And our trial of God is is not in any way a presumption on our part. I mean, we may be hesitant about it. We may want to protest at the whole thing. But the truth is that our faith demands that we participate. Jesus came to Jerusalem Jesus comes to meet us at the center of our world. And he looks us right in the eyes and he asks us, are my claims on you, on your life, on the very whole of your being, are my claims on you just? Today's trial comes at Jesus' own initiative. It's according to God's own will. And however much we'd rather recuse ourselves, we cannot. Now, the accused is charged with bringing God's uncompromising word of love and of peace and of justice into human life. And here he is. He stands right before us, alone at the defense table, under indictment for making us feel awkward, for asking too much of us, for calling us into a way of life that puts us out of step with our more comfortable neighbors. And he confesses all of that right to our faces. He offers no resistance to this trial. And maybe we're confused at finding ourselves in this place, but the truth is that our very faith has brought us right to this spot. And so we stand in this space and we're plainly asked, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I ask you to pronounce this sentence, which is that this disturbing deity must be put out of our way. And for our own sake, he must be crucified. Now things have taken a shocking and shadowy turn when we hear those words. But I want you to listen to the words of the book of the wisdom of Solomon, where it is written that the people said, let us lie in wait for the righteous man, 
because he is inconvenient to us and he opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins against the law and he accuses us of sins against our training. He professes to have the knowledge of God and he calls himself a child of the Lord. He became to us a reproof of our thoughts. The very sight of him is a burden to us. Because his manner of life is unlike that of others, his ways, they are strange. So let us see if his words are true, and let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's child, God will help him and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture so that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial for his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for according to what he says, he will be protected. Thus they reasoned, but they did not know the secret purposes of God, nor hoped for the wages of holiness, nor discerned the prize for blameless souls. This is what the Book of Wisdom says of people who find discipleship too inconvenient, of people who don't want God budding into their lives with unrealistic expectations or awkward obligations, or who are just embarrassed to be seen with a God who keeps company with a lower class of people. Now, maybe those of us who are sitting here today are feeling a bit agitated that the book of wisdom moves so quickly from being inconvenienced by the righteous one to plotting his torture and his murder. You know, we are well-intentioned people who would never have such a person executed, even if he did make our lives a bit more complicated and a bit more awkward. Wisdom rushes us along just too far and too fast. I mean, we are the people who have committed to being here in church for three hours on a Friday, so we're clearly not that bad. (laughs) But it seems as though we don't have that in-between choice today. All we want is some peace in which to do our daily work, to enjoy ourselves on the weekends. All we want is some time when we don't have to think about whether what we're doing is completely in the right, in the clear. Because we know right from wrong. Our faith has taught us good from bad. But do we really have to be on it all the time? Do we have to be on guard against racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia all the time? Because that work is tiring. Do we have to fight for health care and education equity every single day of our lives? Is it okay if we just let our colleagues off the hook if they make what we're sure is a harmless joke? It wasn't meant to offend anyone. We can just let that slip, right? But here comes this inconvenient righteous one who keeps walking the path toward the cross because our God does not ask just for an hour on Sundays and does not just ask us to avoid high-handed felonies, but this God asks for our every breath and our every thought. Our God is a God who desires it all and who does not willingly settle for the bits and pieces that we'll grudgingly concede. You know, we certainly don't want to crucify Jesus, but if we will not invite this righteous one into every moment of our lives, if striving for peace is not central to who we are, if seeking justice for all of God's beloved children isn't the journey that we want to walk each day that we live, then we take our part among his judges who want to put him out of the way once and for all. Can we bring ourselves to admit that when we ask God, the God who 
would just maybe permit us just a little self-indulgence away on the weekends that we maybe don't know what we're asking for? Can we acknowledge that when we ask for a God that will not judge us at all, that we are rejecting a God who longs to forgive us and transform us? And can I, as a, as a modern person, as a capable person, as a person who stands up here and knows what he's doing, confess that maybe I don't know so much after all? For thus they reasoned, but they did not know the secret purposes of God, nor hoped for the wages of holiness, nor discerned the prize for blameless souls. Almighty God, maker of all things, judge of us all, remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who did not hold our waywardness against us, but prayed for us. Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In the name of God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your death, you took away the sting of death. Grant to us, your servants, so to follow in faith where you have led the way, that we may at length fall asleep peacefully in you and wake up in your likeness for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. portion from Psalm 40. I waited patiently upon the Lord. He stooped to me and heard my cry. He put a new song in my mouth a song of praise to our God. Many shall see and stand in awe and put their trust in the Lord. Great things are they that you have done, O Lord my God. How great your wonders and your plans for us. There is none who can be compared with you.
to begin by saying thank you for this invitation to gather us from corner to corner and street to street, from homes far and near, to be together in this moment. It is a great honor to be here with all of you today and to get to hear an abundance of preachers that I don't get, normally get to experience. I also am humbled and grateful for a sign language interpreter. And so if I get distracted, it will be by the beauty of the embodied word. So thank you. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Jesus. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' ministry and life ends with his enacting and embodying the call that has been placed on his life from the very beginning. If we flip back just a few pages to the fourth chapter of Luke, we hear these words. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This call to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and here Jesus is now a captive himself, taking on the pain, suffering, and sentence of the criminals he finds himself in the middle of. To our mind, Jesus seems sort of out of place here. As the one man says, he has done nothing wrong. And yet, where else would Jesus be if not among those whom society deems to be the lowly? In a sermon preached by famous theologian, Car theologian Karl Barth to prisoners in the city of Basel on Good Friday in 1957, he said this, which is more amazing, to find Jesus in such bad company or to find the criminals in such good company? As a matter of fact, both are true. One thing is certain, here they hang all three, Jesus and the criminals, one at the right, one at the left, all three exposed to the same public abuse, to the same interminable pain, to the same slow and irrevocable death throes. Like Jesus, these two criminals had been arrested somewhere, locked up and sentenced by some judge in the course of the previous few days, and now they hang on their crosses with him and find themselves in solidarity and fellowship with him. And friends, we don't even know their names. We don't know the stories of their lives or who will be affected by their deaths. But Jesus does. And because Jesus' message from the beginning has been one of flipping the story, turning the world on its head, liberating those at the bottom of society from the systems, structures, and people who bind them, Jesus extends the same grace and forgiveness he has extended to so many others, to those he has healed, those he has protected, even those he has been mocked by. 
this man asks Jesus to remember him. And Jesus does him one better and says, I'm not just going to remember you, you're coming with me. It's like the scene in a synagogue all over again. Jesus proclaims the good news and release to the captive, saying, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the eyes of all are fixed on him. Except that instead of rolling up the scroll and sitting down, Jesus remains dying between these two men. But where else would Jesus be if not among those whom society deems to be lowly? As much as we might not like to admit it, that is why we find Jesus in our midst as well. As theologian Deborah Mumford writes, God knows we are all products of interrelated, interrelated webs of power and influence. God knows that we are each socialized into structures and social mores that form our beliefs about race, whiteness and white supremacy, class, gender, gender identity, ethnicity, nationality, and religious beliefs. God knows that our actions are influenced by our beliefs, and our beliefs are often flawed. But friends, we have the opportunity to dig deep and uncover the ways in which we are a part of a flawed system, to confess our participation, and to seek forgiveness and repair. And just as Jesus sought forgiveness for those who crucified him and promised paradise to the criminal beside him, we too are forgiven. That forgiveness is a release and a joy and also a responsibility. As Jesus' followers, it is our job to take up the message of proclaiming the good news and having it be actually good, more than just words on the paper. What might that look like in your life? This past Sunday, I was teaching elementary kids in our church school, and they asked me, as predicted, why do you call it Good Friday if it's so bad? Well, forget all the exams that we make seminarians pass to become pastors and priests. That's the real test. To look into the eyes of a seven-year-old and help them flip their understanding of this story and of the world upside down. And let's be honest, I'm going to guess that many of us came here today or are watching today with that same question in our minds. Why do we call it Good Friday if it's really so bad? We call it Good Friday because we know, we know the story doesn't end here. We seek to reclaim and rename this day with the good news of Jesus that we hear and the details of the telling of this story. Today you will be with me in paradise. The kingdom, God's kingdom is open to us and is even here now. God's kingdom is not just a future hope, it's a present reality, and we have that good news to share. So I ask you, what is the call that has been placed by God on you? What are the ways that God asks you to embody and enact the good news? How can you proclaim the story, both God's story and your own, and that it doesn't end in the deepest and darkest moments, but keeps walking the path towards transformation and even resurrection. May we live these stories. May we tell these stories. May we proclaim the good news and live as though today we are in Paris.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name. Amen.
The appointed psalm is a portion of Psalm 27. Please join me in reading responsibly my whole verse. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? Though an army should encamp against me, yet my heart shall not be afraid. One thing have I asked of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing besides her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. My dear brothers and sisters, what a gift it is to be with you here today. To journey with Jesus in his last hours as he comes to us to speak to us, to move our hearts. Jesus does not waste a single breath from the cross. For every breath is one that breathes life and lesson, truth and beauty, goodness and love. And so it is in this breath that he inhales and speaks these powerful words, behold thy son, behold thy mother. We encounter as bystanders, benefactors, and benefactees. You see, as we gather with Jesus on the cross and we hear him utter these words, it is clear that there are those who stand around him. We knew, know that besides Mary, and Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene and the disciple whom he loved, there are others, bystanders, who stand around. Some may be curious. Some are just watching. Some may be whispering under their breath, he saved others, why can't he save himself? Bystanders, just watching, observing, being at a safe distance. And then we hear of Jesus' desire for benefaction, to be a benefactor. As he looks upon his mother, he says to her, Behold thy son. I'm brought back to a mural that is painted on the wall of a library in Vilnius, Lithuania, from where my family hails. And it's a beautiful image of Mother Mary. She's wearing a mantle or an overcoat, so to speak. And she has her arms out like this, in powerful pose, 
and that mantle hangs on her arms, and underneath that mantle, she has her children. She has the whole world you can see in this beautiful image. The faces, men and women, people of God, under her careful mantle. It hearkens to that image of a duck holding its little ducklings under its wings. Jesus calls his mother to be a benefactor to John, to wrap John in her mantle, and to take him on as her son. Jesus encourages his mother to wrap him close and hold him close. We can almost see it with our own eyes, for Mother Mary herself is suffering so greatly at the sight of her son being crucified. And yet in that sorrow, in that brokenness, she is called to be a benefactor to another. And here we see then the shift from benefactor to benefactee. For you see, John is wrapped under her mantle. John must acknowledge that he is in need. So you see, we just learned moments ago that in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is surrounded by those who are closest to him, when trouble came, where did they go? They all fled, including John. But he stayed close, you see. He knew that he needed to be a benefactee. He knew that he was sinful and broken. That because he was the disciple whom Jesus loved, he recognized the need for that love, that vulnerability, that fault, that brokenness that is so a part of his heart. He knew he needed the salvation of him who could give him that mercy and love. He understood what it meant to be a benefactee, and in that moment at the cross, to be wrapped in Mary's mantle, to be taken under her wing, to become a part of the family of God. Bystander, benefactor, benefactee. You see, but Jesus, as I said, does not waste one breath to teach us something powerful in this lesson. He looks to us and reminds us that in this cycle, we are called to be drawn in. We are called to enter into the cycle of service. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, the order of priests of which I am, in his 30-day silent retreat, invites the retreatant to stand at the foot of the cross, and he says it plainly and simply. When we are Christians, when we are called to live our lives as followers of Jesus, we cannot be bystanders. We cannot stand on the peripheries and watch. We cannot be those who say, Yes, Father, I'm a good Catholic. I sit in the back of the church. We heard it so beautifully preached by our first preacher who said, we can't stay away. We can't but engage. We must have to be with him, in him, through him. We cannot be bystanders. So my friends, that leaves us to be benefactors and benefactees. But you see, here's the underbelly. For to be a benefactor alone is not what Jesus teaches. 
how often we think of ourselves as benefactors. And we say, here is my gift, or I am going to help these people. We make a donation, and we walk away. We say, we've given to this charity, or we've helped this cause. And yet, the image that we are given of Mary wrapping John in her mantle means that John has to be close to Mary. Mary literally has to feel him, smell him, understand him. To be benefactor means to draw close to those whom we're called to help, and God bless us here in the Heights for the many blessings that we have that are showered upon us, and yet how many of us find ourselves as true benefactors wrapping under our own mantle, smelling, feeling, understanding those whom we help. To be a benefactor means to understand what it means to give from that which we've received to know where it came from, and that it is not ours to hold, but ours to give. So we are called to be those type of benefactors, and just when we think that that is our calling to be benefactor, we are shoved by the scene to become benefactee. Who of us is worthy? Who of us has it all together? Who of us is without sin or brokenness? How are we called in our lowliness today, standing at the foot of the cross, to recognize our need? Our need for Christ. Our need for each other. In a culture and society that tells us we must be strong and have it all together, what does it mean for us to be vulnerable, broken, afraid? To be benefactee is to recognize our need. Benefactor and benefactee, it's a cycle of service. You see, Jesus, without, without pause, hammers home this point this cycle of service. John 19, he says, as we hear and just heard, mother and son, son and mother. John 13, the washing of the disciples' feet, go and do likewise. Luke 7, the woman anointing Jesus' feet, having been forgiven. Mark 1, Peter's mother-in-law, having been cured, serves them at the table. Acts the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples and they run to preach the good news and heal and teach and change. It's a cycle of service, of benefactor, benefactee. It is not an experience of bystander. Jesus sets this into motion for us today. Are you a bystander? Are you a benefactor? Are you a benefactee? Enter into the cycle of service, and it will change everything. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother.
Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
The appointed psalm is a portion of Psalm 22. Please join me in reading responsively by whole verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him endure. Let him render to him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. noon on. Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One by one, they left him. First, it was the crowd. Oh, they'd been so eager to welcome him on Sunday. They paraded into Jerusalem with shouts of, Hosanna! Their enthusiasm was so exuberant that it seemed they might sweep him all the way to Herod's palace. But when he failed to live up to the role of the conquering hero, they moved on to other would-be messiahs. By the end of the week, some of the very same people were calling for his execution. Then it was Judas, one of the first to join him. Judas was also the first of his inner circle to give up on him. But he didn't just give up on him. He sold him out. The chief priests wanted to arrest Jesus earlier, but there were always too many people around. They couldn't risk a commotion, not with the added security from Rome in the city. The last thing they wanted was an uprising, an excuse for the Romans to crack down during the Passover festival. The problem was, Jesus never seemed to be alone. He and his followers always left the city at the end of the day and no one knew where they went. The chief priest needed an inside man. They found him in Judas. Now, 30 pieces of silver was not an insignificant sum, but in truth, it didn't really seem to take much to convince him. Perhaps Judas had grown disillusioned with his master, tired of waiting for him to reveal his identity and restore the kingdom of Israel. Maybe it was the incident in Simon's home. Judas was incensed when a woman wastefully broke open a jar of expensive perfume and scandalously poured it on Jesus while he did nothing to stop her. Or maybe he just did it for the money whatever his motivation, Judas not only left Jesus, he betrayed him. Now the others may not have betrayed him, but they certainly let him down. 
as events began to unfold, Jesus' soul was troubled. He went to a quiet place to pray, and he asked his closest friends, Peter, James, and John, to go with him. Three times he paused his own prayers to check on them. Each time, they were asleep. They couldn't keep their eyes open even for a few minutes to pray for him in his hour of need. When the temple guards showed up, the disciples fled, every last one of them. Their loyalty to Jesus melted away in the face of their own fear. Three years of ministry together, the things they'd done, the things they'd seen Jesus do, the trust they'd built, You'd think they would have a little more faith in him. But no. At the first sign of trouble, they ran away. Of course, Peter didn't completely disappear. He followed from a distance. Just hours earlier, he'd insisted that he would stand with Jesus no matter what the cost. But his confidence only extended as far as the edge of the shadows. The cold made him emerge long enough to warm his hands by the fire where someone recognized him, then another. He denied that he was a follower of Jesus, but his accent betrayed him. Surely you are one of his followers. At this, brave Peter, courageous Peter, determined Peter, cursed and swore and insisted he had no idea who Jesus was. Before the Sanhedrin, Jesus stood by silently while a steady stream of witnesses offered false testimony, one after the other. Was there no one to speak for him? After all the people he'd helped, all the people moved by his teaching, all the lives he had changed, would no one support him? When they dragged him before Pilate to have him condemned, the darkness seemed to close in. One last appeal to the crowd. Maybe someone there would call out for mercy. No. When Pilate offered them a chance to liberate a prisoner, they chose a troublemaker over the Prince of Peace. And when he asked what he should do with Jesus instead, they called for his execution, the most brutal, humiliating form of execution in the Roman world. Jesus was all alone. Everyone he knew, everyone he loved, everyone he thought loved him, had deserted him. But of all those who abandoned him, there was one he didn't see coming. And that one hurt the most. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Jesus' words make our hearts ache but they also challenge our theology. This is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Christ of the same substance with the Father. How is it possible for him to be forsaken by God? The Gospel writers portray a very human Jesus on the cross, one who suffers much like anyone else would. It is a natural human experience to feel alone in the midst of suffering. Abandoned, perhaps even by God. Maybe in this moment, he he needed to be distant from God to truly be one of us. To truly be human. Only a Christ who suffers with us can suffer for us. Even though he had known where this road would lead, even though he knew what would happen on the other side of death, there was no avoiding the pain 
and the agony of the cross. It was excruciating. But what was worse was the abandonment, the utter aloneness of his suffering. Though Jesus died a human death, a painful and humiliating death, we must remember that it was not merely a human death. The crucifixion was not the act of an abusive parent whose bloodlust could only be satisfied by human sacrifice. My friends, that was God on the cross. The incarnate presence who would go to any length to redeem us and bring us back. God gave everything to be one of us, to walk among us, offering us boundless love, grace upon grace, arms wide open to embrace the world God loves. And this is how the world responded. My friends, what Jesus felt on the cross must surely be how God feels about us. Praise flows freely when we are surrounded by others who think and act and believe like us. But in different company, we soft pedal so we don't appear to be too religious. We don't deny knowing God. We just don't want to be seen as fanatics. We don't intentionally speak against God, but we don't exactly go out of our way to speak up for God either, or to call out those who distort our Christian witness. It's not that we abandon God. It turns out we just weren't all that committed to begin with. We may never openly seek a different savior, yet we so often choose the strong over the compassionate. We would never consciously betray God to our enemies, but when profit is at stake, we all have blood on our hands. We may never call for God's execution, but we so often behave as though God is already dead. Here today, as we gaze upon the cross, we are confronted by our failure, our feeble witness in the face of such boundless love. This moment demands something of us. The one who gave everything for us hangs helplessly on a tree, alone. Jesus walked this lonesome valley. He had to walk it by himself. Oh, nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. What he did, he did for us. Will we forsake him too?
deal as you're able. Let us pray. Lord God, whose blessed Son, our Savior, gave his body to be whipped and his face to be spit upon, give us grace to accept joyfully the sufferings of the present time, confident of the glory that shall be revealed through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
the appointed psalm is a portion of Psalm 42. Let us read it responsibly by whole verse. As the deer longs for the water brooks, so longs my soul for you, O God. My tears have been my food day and night, while all day long they say to me, Where now is your God? With the voice of praise and thanksgiving among those who keep holy day, Put your trust in God, for I will yet give thanks to him who is the help of my countenance and my God. After this, when Jesus knew all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who teaches simultaneously at the law schools of Columbia and Berkeley, introduced a phrase into the American vocabulary, which has over the years met with some resistance. The phrase is intersectionality. It's embedded within her concept of critical race theory. The notion being that you cannot understand some things simply by looking at it from one point of view. One thing intersects with another. And in that intersection, one thing sheds light upon another. Race sheds light upon gender. Gender sheds light upon class. Class sheds light upon sexual orientation. Nothing can be viewed by a single lens. Life is a matter of intersectionality. So is this passage. So is Jesus cannot understand Jesus by looking at him through a single lens. It is the intersection of Jesus in his humanity and Jesus and his divinity. Neither one by themselves ever allow you to fully comprehend who he is or what he was enduring on this day. Intersectionality. So first we meet the Jesus of full humanity. Cries out, I'm thirsty. Not a strange thing to say when you consider what he has been enduring for the last many hours. For the last many hours. He has received 39 lashes against his back. 
not an act of mercy because they believed that 40 would have killed you. 39 to keep you alive long enough to finish the job on the cross. And with every stroke of the whip, flesh is torn away and blood flows, weakening the body. The crown of thorns has been pressed upon the brow, increasing the pain, increasing the suffering, increasing the anguish, and letting loose yet more blood. And then he's forced to carry the cross not these gold pieces of jewelry we wear upon our lapels or lightly around our necks. 165 pounds of wood laid upon the shoulders of a man who's just received 39 lashes. And a tremendous loss of blood. And once he's at Calvary, and lay down that 165 pounds of wood is then nailed to it. Not carpet nails, not carpenter's nails. Not the nails you use in your homes. Spikes! The size of railroad spikes driven not really through the palms, but through the wrists. Not through the feet, but through the ankles. And driven in such a way as to position the body so that one cannot exhale and inhale. One cannot push oneself up to capture a breath. And so what one dies from on the cross is in the end suffocation. Can you see him? Can you feel him? Can you hear him saying, I'm thirsty? This is the human Jesus. All of his other work now accomplished. Forgiving those who put him there. Promising paradise to one who was dying at his side. Attending to the needs of his mother. Wondering about the presence of his father. And then crying out. I'm thirsty. That's one lens. There is another. There is an intersection. Jesus on the cross was not just dying. He was quoting. He wasn't just pouring out his life. He was pouring out his confession. The text says he cried out, I am thirsty, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Do not think about Jesus on the cross as in some state of desperation. As if somehow he felt that there was no one there but him. Read all of Psalm 22. Read it all the way to the end of Psalm 22. And understand that what Jesus was doing was comforting himself by the words of Scripture. And even though the dogs had surrounded him and death was all about him, yet he felt himself secure in the presence of God. intersectionality. A man who had been through as much as he had been through 
39 lashes, crown of thorns, nailed to a cross, surrounded by a howling mob, and yet with the presence of mind, the depth of faith, to quote the scripture. Here it is in Psalm 22. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. That's in Psalm 22. Also in Psalm 22 it says, And they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. As if in the psalm he was reminding himself that even what the Roman soldiers were doing with his garments was all a part of his faith journey. He understood what was going on. Even in his death, he clung to his faith. Even in his death, Psalm 119, verse 11, was his guiding principle. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This was not the first time in the midst of anguish and grief and pain and sorrow that Jesus clung to the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 4, he was sent out into the wilderness. The Bible says to be tempted, to be tested, to be tried by the devil. His journey was to last 40 days. Satan was wise enough not to try Jesus on the first day or the first week or the first month. He waited till the 40th day, certain that a man who had had neither food nor drink for 40 days in the sweltering heat of a Judean desert was now ripe for exploitation. And so he comes. Turn stones into bread. You've got to be hungry. Man does not live by bread alone. Deuteronomy. Jump off the temple and have the angels come and catch you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy. I will give you the kingdoms of the world if you'll just bow down and worship me. shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Deuteronomy. In his hardest moments desperation was the farthest thing from his mind because his faith in God was so internalized that whether in the desert with the devil or on the cross between two others, he comfortably, confidently quoted from Scripture. His Father's word was in his heart. Is yours? Is God's word so deeply embedded in our hearts that in our most trying moments, we do not panic, we just remember? We just call it up. We just lean into it. In April of 1963, they put Martin Luther King Jr. into a jail cell. 
in Birmingham, Alabama. They put him there in isolation, they thought. And he began to write. He had no library available, no Google, no resource. But in that jail cell in Birmingham, crowded in and surrounded by all that being black in Birmingham in 1963 could mean, he wrote this most marvelous letter that quoted from Plato and Martin Buber and Paul Tillich and John Bunyan and Thomas Jefferson and Moses and Jesus accurately because those words were not memorized in his head. They were written on his heart. So with Jesus. On the cross, the physical Jesus, the, the human Jesus, feeling what any human being would feel under those conditions, I am thirsty. But the intersection of his divinity and his humanity finds him calling up from Psalm 22 that which gave him strength in that hour that I am not alone. There is a tragic irony today as we think about Jesus hiding God's word in his heart. There is someone among us, not in this room, in this nation, who has bizarrely compared himself to Jesus. And now has the audacity to sell God bless the USA Bibles. I wonder if he has hidden those words in his heart or is just holding it in his hand. At least when he advertised it on cable TV, he was holding it in the right position. <laughs> because the last time we saw him holding a Bible in front of an Episcopal church, it was in Washington, D.C., upside down, as is most of his thinking. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Intersectionality. The human Jesus, thirsty. The divine Jesus, full of grace and truth.
please kneel as you're able. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The appointed psalm is 130. Let us read it responsively by whole verse. Out of the depths have I called you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. For there is forgiveness with you. Therefore, you shall be feared. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning.
With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. I want you to take a look at your hand. Not many of us have as talented or expressive hands as those who are doing the sign language interpretation today, who are literally proclaiming the gospel with their hands. But we each have something unique in these hands. And lately when I look at mine, I see wrinkles and veins that stick out. And as of late, a tremor. I see dry skin from the weather and hand washing and a whole lot of folding my hands in prayer or lifting them up for a blessing. One of the things I really missed as a pastor during those years of COVID was holding people's hands in mine as we passed the peace or greeted one another after the service or laid a loved one to rest. So much is communicated through the grasp of a hand, welcome and friendship, hello and goodbye, peace and gratitude, compassion and sympathy. I miss my children's hands, bigger than mine now, full grown as they are, living out of town and out of the country with little need of my hand to help or to guide them. I realize how much I try to hold in my hands, too much sometimes. Too much as I've raised children and cared for home and possessions, as I've held bread to bless and break and share, as I've comforted the bereaved, absorbed prayer concerns, shepherded a church toward health, tried to influence my neighborhood and community toward gospel values of justice and peace. So much I've tried to hold on to for so long, and so much I've had to let go. Martin Luther once said, I have held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed into God's hands, that I still possess. When Jesus was crucified on that Roman cross so long ago, they stretched out his hands and drove the nails through. Those precious hands that had blessed children and healed the sick, touched mud and earth, wine and bread, lepers and sinners, those very human hands that were bruised and bled, for 15 hours, Jesus had been in the hands of his tormentors. With their hands, they beat him and slapped him and abused him. With their hands, they crowned him with thorns and whipped his back. And now those violent hands have done all they can do. The 
Gospel of Luke tells us, in the midst of incredible pain in his hands and legs, pain in both body and spirit, Jesus has a final prayer. And it is not a meek prayer, it is a strong prayer. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In another translation, Father, into your hands I entrust my life. It's likely to be sure that this would not have been the first time Jesus said this prayer. It's a direct quotation from Psalm 31, verse 5. Jesus, facing death, approached it in the same way he approached life. He committed everything to God. His life had always been in God's hands, and now he puts his death in God's hands, too. This particular word from the cross was an expression of his entire life. Jesus could die, sure he would be safe in God's hands as he had been all his life. This prayer is a prayer of communion with God. It's a prayer of confidence in the power of God, and it's a prayer of commitment. Jesus entrusting his father to prosper the work he had done on the cross. He deposited his soul, his love, his life with God. I'm told that Jewish parents today still teach their children this prayer as they've done for centuries at night. This piece, this prayer, into your hands, I commend my spirit. It's similar to how some of us were taught to pray, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray, O oh Lord, my soul to keep. I don't know today how many parents add the next verse of the prayer that many of us learned as children. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul Because generally, we, we don't like to acknowledge death's inevitability. But whether it's at the end of a day or the end of a life, when darkness and uncertainty, even death, is at hand, there's only one thing left for us to say, into your hands, O oh Lord, I entrust my life. One of the things I've saved for many years, and I'm sure some of you have too, if you had a similar item in your home, is the plaster cast of my youngest child of his handprint. He was seven at the time. And I don't know why I still keep it or why it means so much to me when so much else has been put aside. But I think it symbolizes the hands I have held and the hands that someday may hold me when my time is done. The handprint, too, makes me think of baptism, when other pastors' hands dripped water on my babies four baptisms in three different churches in three different states far from our home, who nevertheless promised to lovingly guide our children to have a hand in their growing up and growing in faith for however long we resided there on behalf of the whole church. It's an embodied enactment of one of my favorite meditations from Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body on earth but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has nobody now on earth but yours. No, we are not Jesus. But 
but we are called to love as Jesus loved, to live in faithfulness to thy will be done, to take up our cross and to follow, to bless one another's babies and callings and home goings, and ours are the lips that utter words of grace and mercy, or do not. When the risen Lord appears to his disciples on the eve of resurrection morn, it will be his hands that Thomas asked to see as evidence of Jesus' identity, as proof of his suffering, sacrificial, redeeming love. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, Thomas says, and Jesus responds by once again presenting his hands and his side and by inviting Thomas to stretch out his own hand in response. May the work of your hands, the words of your mouths, the prayers of your heart be blessed on this Good Friday when the Savior of the world stretched out his hands for our redemption. May you know forgiveness from God for your sins, and may you forgive others as God has forgiven you. And may you breathe deeply, stretching out your hands, entrusting your body and your soul, your very life, into God's hands.
please kneel as you are able. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The appointed psalm is a portion of Psalm 31. Let us read it responsibly by whole verse. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth.
when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Ten days from now, my husband and I will climb into a U-Haul truck loaded with all our worldly possessions and drive it 700 miles to our new home in Boston, a home we've seen only in a brief FaceTime call but signed a 14-month lease on, which seemed like a perfectly sound idea until I said it out loud. <laughs> Which is to say that for several days now, I have been living in a space of transition, or what I prefer to call liminal space. From the Latin word for threshold, the concept of liminal space comes to us from the well of Celtic spirituality. Liminal spaces exist on borders between what was and what will be. They are spaces of transition and transformation, spaces imbued with both grief for what is lost and hope for what lies ahead. The Catholic mystic Richard Rohr claims that all spiritual transformation occurs in liminal space, and that the very purpose of religion is to draw us into these spaces, where in his words, the old world falls apart and a bigger world is revealed. Today, we find ourselves in the most profound of all liminal spaces on this day that focuses us on the death that forever transformed death. And on this particular Good Friday, as I prepare to bid this community farewell, I am remembering in my heart the saints who crossed the threshold of death during my ministry here. Indeed, it was only a few weeks ago that I last witnessed a beloved member of this community take his final breath. On that day, I stood outside his intensive care room and watched as the medical team removed the tubes and wires to the machines that were sustaining his life. As I prepared to hallow that space with prayer, I witnessed in the actions of that medical team a humble admission of defeat, an admission of the limits of our human power to contend with death an admission that the most cutting-edge medical technology our greatest minds have manufactured, the best of human ingenuity and innovation, simply cannot defeat death. And into that space of ostensible defeat, I prayed these ancient words of hope into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant. Receive him into the arms of your mercy. If my ministry in this place has taught me anything, it is to be grateful for the privilege of standing in the liminal space between this life and the next to be grateful for the privilege of consecrating these spaces with a reminder of God's victory over death. That is, after all, the Church's bold proclamation. That is the reason we Christians dare to call this day good. 
Because our Lord, in his death, has conquered death forever. So that when our day comes, we can enter that liminal space without fear, knowing that death does not have the final word. Where the world sees death and defeat, the church dares to cry victory. On this most solemn Friday, Jesus' arms are stretched out on the hard wood of the cross, and we mourn the sin that nailed them there. But even as our hearts are heavy with grief, we find hope in the assurance that despite our complicity in that very sin, Jesus' merciful arms of love stand ready to receive us at the moment of our final breath. That comforting assurance was spoken to us just moments ago in our Lord's dying words, It is finished. These words mark a dramatic climax in the passion narrative of John's Gospel. What began with the turning of water into wine at a wedding in Cana ends with Jesus crucified at Golgotha. And when that final moment comes for him, Jesus pronounces his own death. It is finished. He declares before in the expression of the King James, he gives up the ghost. Now I must offer a word of caution that the English translation, it is finished, is a highly imperfect one because it fails to capture the fullness of the original Greek. A more accurate translation would have our Lord say it is completed, or it is fulfilled, or even perhaps mission accomplished. Even if you understand nary a word of Latin, you can still hear the full force in the Latin rendering, consummatum est. When Jesus says it is finished, he's not saying the end or it's over. Make no mistake, these are not words of resignation. When Jesus says, it is finished, he places his death squarely into God's plan for the world's redemption. Far from an admission of defeat, it is finished is a resounding declaration of victory. The great irony, of course, is that nothing in this scene resembles victory as the world understands it. The onlookers who beheld Jesus' bloodied, lifeless body hanging from that cross would surely have been convinced of his defeat. But with his words, it is finished. Jesus makes the outrageous claim that his death actually completes his mission, that his death accomplishes the will of his Father. As the words, it is finished, cross Jesus' lips, the old world falls away, and a bigger world is indeed revealed. With this singular utterance, a new day dawns in salvation history, and the power of death loses its grip on humanity forever. This is the glorious paradox of the cross. Jesus defeats the powers of evil by willingly submitting to them. And in this act of submission, death is defeated, and by his death, Jesus takes away the sting of death. Only days ago, as our Holy Week journey began, we played the part of that jubilant Palm Sunday crowd the crowd that proclaimed Jesus King of Kings and Lord of Lords with palm branches. Palm branches that were in the ancient world symbols of victory. Only days later, the crowd that cried Hosanna has now cried crucify him. And those palm branches of victory now lie in the dust of apparent defeat. 
as we gather here today at the foot of the cross to hallow this liminal space with our presence, prayers, and hymns, even as those palm branches lie withered and trodden, we are assured that the debt of our sin, the debt we could never repay, has indeed been paid in full. And victory has been declared. We are blessed in this sacred space by this glorious pendant cross hanging above the altar where Jesus nourishes us week after week with his body and blood. And today, even as it is shrouded in the black of mourning, it shimmers with the gold of victory, reminding us of our Lord's triumph. As we sit on this threshold between death and resurrection, I invite you to meditate on this cross during the anthem that follows. In this liminal space that has room for both our grief and our joy, Ponder the enormity of God's love for you. The love that transformed an instrument of shameful death to be for us the very means of life. Behold the profound mystery of your redemption, the salvation that was accomplished, completed, yes, finished for you on Calvary 2,000 years ago on this Friday that is for us most assuredly, most wondrously good.
Jesus agonizing in the garden. Jesus betrayed with a kiss. Jesus condemned by the high priest. Jesus denied by your disciples. Jesus enduring blows and spitting. Jesus filled with shame and sorrow. Jesus given no rest. Jesus hauled before Pilate. Jesus disparaged by the chief priests. Jesus ridiculed by Herod. Jesus kept and scourged while Barabbas, while Barabbas was released. Jesus led away to Calvary. Jesus made to carry your cross. Jesus nailed to the cross. Jesus offered wine mingled with myrrh. Jesus praying for your enemies. Jesus misquoted by the priests. Jesus taunted by the thieves. Jesus saying, why have you forsaken me? Jesus thirsting and given vinegar to drink. Jesus uttering a loud cry and giving up your spirit. Jesus wrapped in linen and laid in the grave. Jesus descended to the dead. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and Holy Spirit, you live and reign one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. 